Hello, friends. This is Dave Hurwitz, executive editor at ClassicsToday.com, here with the ideal list of Mozart operas. Now, this was a project, but a, a, an interesting one for several reasons. Mozart wrote about 18 operas, 18 operas that he himself completed. I'm not counting pasticcios, you know, groups of arias by different people or joint projects with other composers. Singleton compositions that he actually completed. So I'm not talking about incomplete works like Zaid. You know, Mozart's operas are a, a very special body of work because Mozart is the first composer whose works entered the modern repertoire and stayed there. There are some composers who are in the modern repertoire now, like Handel, and there are some who have sort of hovered on the fringes, like Gluck. Every so often something pops up. But Mozart's comic operas particularly, plus the magic flute, have always been in the modern repertoire, from the Marriage of Figaro on. And so he's really the first great composer of opera as we know it today. But those were his last works. There's a whole slew of earlier ones. And for most of our lives, those were ignored, completely ignored, along with all the other dead operas that nobody chooses to revive. And the reasons for that are, are numerous. It's the style of the works themselves. That is, for example, opera Syria or serious opera Baroque style with acres and acres of secco recitative. And, and long, incredibly elaborate arias that people don't want to bother learning how to sing, and the dearth of singers who could actually do them, do them justice, and the comparative richness of the late works, which is so phenomenal that it just cast all of his earlier pieces into the shade. So you have a body of work which has been recorded innumerable times, by all the greatest singers and conductors in the world. And then you have a body of work which has been totally ignored and only recently has begun to be revived by the period instrument people. Some of it is quite good for what it is. And we have to be a little bit careful there because there's no point in comparing it to Mozart's late work, which is absolutely sui generis and extraordinary. These earlier works were written to make his name to give himself reputation, seek an appointment, earn, earn cash, do all of that stuff when he was younger. And as I said, he was a genius. And of course, he, he, he enriched every medium in which he worked in one way or another. But that does not mean that the works themselves are all that important. So in coming up with this idealist, I've picked a couple of, I think, the best of the early works. And you may disagree with my choices. You could always pick your own. But I think these make sense because not only are they the best, I think, of the earlier works, but they're good recordings of them. So I picked a couple of those. And then sort of the the great Mozart operas, which actually didn't begin with the marriage of Figaro. Arguably, they began with Idomeneo which he wrote for Munich, and which also has only really come into its own recently. That is, it's been performed in something close to the manner in which Mozart wrote it. So let's just get through the list, because this is going to take a little time. We've got a lot of stuff to talk about, even limiting our selection to, let's see, how many have I got here? One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine or so half of Mozart's operatic output. And I think for most of us, that will be more than enough. I really, really do. So what do we start with? Well, I chose to begin with Lucio Silla. What is a Lucio Silla? Okay. Now, Lucio Silla is one of three opera seria opera Syrie, Syria's series, serious operas, that's easier, that Mozart wrote for Milan uh, when he was in Italy with his dad, trying to show everybody how smart he was. And, and this is probably the best of those three opera series. The other ones were Ascanio and Alba and Mitridate Re di Ponto, 
which I used to call Mercadante, Ray de Ponto, but don't don't get me wrong. Mercadante was another composer. Severio Mercadante from the 19th century wrote a lot of operas. Anyway, now Mitridate or Mitridante or Mitra Mitra or something. I have it here. Wait a minute. I of course I wrote about it in my book on on Mozart's vocal music. Here it is. Plug the book. Plug the book. There we go. Everybody should have the book. Uh, let's see. What was this thing called? Yes, Mitridate. Not Mitridante, which is like Andante. These names all sound the same to me anyway. But you're not going to listen to it, so who cares, right? Anyway, Lucio Silla is probably the best because it has the best operas compared to acres and acres of secco recitative where you have just a light harpsichord accompaniment and people chat with each other endlessly in Italian. And this is a really hot performance of it featuring Adam Fisher and the Danish Radio Sinfonietta on Da Capo. It's easily the best version of it. And the cast is, let's see, uh, Lothar Adinius and Simone Nold and, and Christina uh, Hammer something or other, Hammerstrom. And, uh, oh, never mind. These aren't people we've heard of anyway. Well, I mean, if you're an opera crazy person. You probably have heard of some of these people. It doesn't matter. They're all very, very fine singers. It's really an excellent performance of the opera, and it's the best performance of the opera, which has not received many recordings. And you can get it and give yourself a sense of what Mozart was doing in the realm of serious opera in his youth. After this, he abandoned opera Syria with one notable exception, La Clemenza di Tito at the very, very end of his life, which was written for a special occasion. And so it's great stuff for what it is. And that is my choice for the early, early opera seria side of Mozart's output. Then there is the buffa side. Now in the buffa side or comic opera end of the universe, there are really two and I picked the second one. The first was La Finta Semplice. Finta in Italian, F-I-N-T-A, means fake or false. And the world of comic opera in Mozart's day is full of fintas. Everything is a finta. Everybody is a fake something because they're all in disguise. You know, they're a fake plastic surgeon or a fake astronaut or a fake policeman. Well, I mean, in Mozart's day, some of those jobs were not the same as they are today. So in this case, you have the fake simpleton. And then his second comic opera, which was La Finta Giardiniera. Now, you know what a giardiniera is. I mean, if you go to the supermarket, you see those jars of of pickled vegetables in the Italian food section called giardiniera salad, right? But a giardiniera is not a pickled vegetable salad. A giardiniera is a lady gardener. And it's the, the gardener that we're interested in. La finta giardiniera means the fake gardener. And the fake gardener in these things, and lots of Handel's operas too, you have some sort of dispossessed noble person trying to spy on their their girlfriend or boyfriend who they think is having an affair with somebody else. So they dress up as a servant. And as often as not, that servant is a gardener because having them be like a maid or a butler or a chamber pot swiper or whatever they did would have been either too gross or too obvious. And gardeners got to like stay outside and hum around and watch everybody do their thing. So in this case, we have the fake lady gardener. This sucker is a good solid three hours long with zillions of endless operas, I mean arias, excuse me, and acres again of witty chatty recitative that you want to skip over to get to the arias. It's actually got a lot of good music in it. Um, and aside from its absolutely obscene length, the difference between this comic opera and Mozart's later comic operas, I can summarize for you very simply just by telling you what the cast list is. It's really very, very amusing. And I'm going to let me do that because I, I, I wrote it in, in my book here. So I might as well use this for something. Um, the Fake Lady Gardener. Here are the people in the fake lady gardener. This is just the cast. Are you ready? And their relationships to each other. 
you have Don Anquise. Don Anquise is the mayor of Lagonero, and he's in love with Sandrina, who's the gardener. Then we have the Marchesa Violanti Onesti. Now, the Marchesa is the lover of Count Belfior, and she's believed to be dead, and she's pretending to be the gardener, Sandrina. So Sandrina is the Marchese. Remember that. Violante and Sandrina are the same person. Then we get Count Belfior, formerly in love with Violante, but he thinks she's dead. So now he's the lover of Arminda. Now, Arminda is a Milanese lady, a Milanese lady, previously in love with Cavaliere Ramiro. And now she's engaged to Count Belfior. Now, Cavaliere Ramiro is in love with Arminda, but she's left him because she's engaged to Count Belfior, who supposedly was in love with Violante, who's disguised as Sandrina, who is loved by the mayor. Got it? Then we get Serpetta. <laughs> Serpetta is the mayor's maid, and she's in love with him, of course, because everybody's in love with everybody else. And finally, we get Roberto, Violante's servant, because there's always a pair of, of servants to provide the, the lower class peasant element in these things. Um, and Roberto is pretending to be Violante's cousin, and he's but while he's doing that, he's disguised as a gardener named Nardo, and he's in love with Serpetta, even though Serpetta is in love with the mayor. Okay. Now, how does this differ from Mozart's other operas? Well, the reason it differs is because, you know, operas are are especially these opera buffas are, are famous for having somewhat convoluted plots, but this one is really typical for La Finta Giardiniera. And as you can tell, you've got all these characters who are multiple cases of mistaken identity and presumed death, and everybody's in love with the wrong person. How long do you think it's going to take to work that stuff out? And the bottom line is that the plot is so complicated that there is no time for the thing that makes Mozart's later opera so great, which is their wonderful warmth of human characterization, the ability to develop thinking, feeling people. And so we cannot praise Lorenzo de Ponte, Mozart's librettist, enough for writing comic operas, which gave Mozart the time and space within the normal length. I mean, most of them are shorter than, than this one. Um, to actually develop characters, a limited number, with a plot scenario that isn't so whacked out that you spend all of your time writing recitative to even trying to figure out who is doing what to whom and what their relationship is. Mozart's later operas are a model of dramatic clarity. And the dramatic clarity, of course, gave Mozart the opportunity to write music that supports it. So it's all about the story. However, we're talking about recordings of operas. And if you want La Finta Giardiniera, there were only two. There were Harn, there was Harnencourts, which is out of print, though you may find it buzzing around. And there's this excellent one on Harmonia Mundi from René Jacob. Um, the cast is, uh, who cares who the cast is? I'm not even going into it. It's the René Jacob Finta Jardiniera, and it's really good. And, and you don't have that much choice because these early operas, like I said, have not been, have not received that much recording, that many recordings. And so you get La Jardiniera here, and you can buy the salad in the supermarket, put on your opera, and have a double Jardiniera dose if that's what turns you on. Next get to these serious Mozart operas. Now, Idomeneo is a hybrid work. I have to tell you, I have an Idomeneo story. Idomeneo is also about three hours long. It's never performed uncut. It's almost never performed in its original form. It contains acres and acres and acres of magnificent music, mostly continuously written. I mean, huge stretches with no sick or recitative at all. It's absolutely magnificent. It is an opera seria, and because of that, it's really, 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 
really long and involved. The story, though, is the same thing as sort of Handel's Jephthah. And you, you know the story a million times. You know, guy say, you know, uh, uh, the king says praise to God or the gods in this case, but it could be, it could be the regular God that we all know and love, or it could be, it could be one of the pagan gods of your. It doesn't matter. He's in a storm and his ship's going to get wrecked, or he's going to get defeated by the you know, fill in the name of enemy, whatever. And if if he wins, he will sacrifice to the gods the first person he lays eyes on. And the gods go, deal! And so, of course, he pops up and the first person that he runs into is his daughter or his son or his, you know, fill in name of loved one related to said monarch. And that's the story. The rest of it is everything gets worked out, you know, in the end. And the gods have mercy, usually. And that's what happens. And of course, in this particular opera, this this is a, a Greek opera, so it has many familiar characters. You've got Electra, famous later from like Richard Strauss. You've got Iphigenia, because Iphigenia was everywhere, as we know. And you've got all these all these people who we already know about, and they are in Idomeneo. And and it's really just a terrific opera. But I have to tell you, when I was I was running repertoire for my community orchestra, the New York Symphonic Arts Ensemble. And we used to audition conductors, you know, for our regular season. And they had to propose things that they wanted to perform with us that they thought would be interesting. And we were always interested in doing, you know, more unusual repertoire, except there was one cranky old coot. I don't remember what his name was. I'm not going to say it anyway. He was, he was Viennese and grouchy and miserable and, and we did reading rehearsals with him. And his repertoire suggestion was a concert version of the complete Idomeneo, which is just what you want for free concerts for mostly little old ladies on Sunday afternoons in Manhattan. Well, needless to say, he was not engaged to do that. But the opera itself, when you have dynamite singers, is fantastic. And again, we have to talk about good old Rene Jacob. This is such a great series. And I'm not I'm not playing with, you know, I have to have a different conductor or something for every opera because because I just want to I really want to just do a list that has, like I said, no weak links and is available. And so I, I'm working on those those twin factors. And so if, there are gonna be a couple repeats here, and that's just the way it is. Anyway, this is a fantastic fantastic performance of the complete Idomeneo. It stars Richard Croft, Bernarda Fink, Sun Hei Im, Alexandrina Pender Rishki, Yashashenshka Yes, and that's where I give up doing the cast list. It's with the Freiburg Baroque Orchestra, the RAIS Camera Corps, it's on Harmonia Mundi, and it's great! So if you want Idomeneo, Here's your best bet. Now, you may have noted that that is a period instrument performance, and I am going to freely mix uh, modern instrument performances with period instrument performances. I am, am not as revolted by period instruments in opera performances as I am in, in uh, sometimes symphonic performances because they're accompanying and they accompany very, very well. And because what matters in opera, it may come as no surprise to you, is the singing. And if you've got great singers, it doesn't matter. And you really can't have period singers because they can't be dead. They're all alive. They're all modern singers. They all have modern voices. And in fact, one of the ways that we know that a lot of what the period people do is stupid is because the ideal for instrumental tone and technique was the human voice. And the human voice has not changed at all since Mozart's day, because our DNA is basically the same. Unless voices have mutated in ways we had no idea, everybody is still singing and everybody's voice still sounds basically the same. It's produced the same way. It comes out the same way. And so if you sound like a voice, then you're doing the right thing. And that is all you need to know, basically, about instrumental performance. And I think some of these Baroque uh, and period instrument performances of opera have been fabulous. Fabulous in two ways. Number one, they tend to really 
speed up the recitative business and create a, a natural conversational ebb and flow to the dialogue, which moves the drama along more quickly. And number two, the liveliness, the freshness, the, the, the wonderful timbres in the orchestra, all of those things support opera extremely well. So I am a big fan of opera on period instruments when it's well done, of course, when the singers are great and when the orchestra is not one of those tiny pint-sized anemic little, you know, well, back in the day they couldn't afford a real orchestra, so they did it with three and a half people. No, no, no. As long as it's big enough and operatic enough and dramatic, I'm all for it. So let's make that clear. <clears throat> so after Idomeneo, we get Die Entführung aus dem Serai, the abduction from the Seraglio. Well, the abduction from the Seraglio is a an abduction opera. There was a whole pile of them about about virtuous Western white women being held in harems by really not less virtuous um, Muslim harem people, you know, noble noble people, and it's about how they get rescued by their lovers and usually caught and usually pardoned. Haydn wrote one called L'Incontro Improviso, the, the Unexpected Encounter, which is really quite marvelous. It's a beautiful piece and it has Turkish percussion, as does Mozart's, which is bass drum, cymbals, triangle, a jingling Johnny thing. And L'Incontro Improviso was also an opera by Gluck. All of these plots were set numerous times. Lucio Silla, there's a million Sillas, a zillion Sillas. Handel wrote a Silla. Then there's, there's, there's Idomeneos all over the place, and there are abduction operas all over the place. But Mozart's, of course, was famous. First of all, it's a Zingspiel. It's an opera with dialogue, and you want to have as little dialogue as you possibly can. Not because it's in German, it's fine that it's in German, but because who wants to listen to the dialogue? I mean, you know, just listen to the arias, which are amazing and gorgeous. And my choice for the for the Entführung actually is Schulte. Good old Schulte, who made some wonderful Mozart opera recordings, but this has a terrific cast. You've got Edita Gruberova, Kathleen Battle, Gustav Vinberg, um, let's see here, who else is there? Heinz Zednik, Marty Talvola. I mean, really, it's just a terrific cast. And it's, you know, it's, of course, the Vienna Philharmonic, and it's gorgeous. It's a perfectly great abduction. So abduct away. Get your abductor muscles going, and you're in business. And skip the dialogue. Really, it's just, it's just annoying. It really is. Then we get the marriage of Figaro. Now we're in, like, really familiar Mozart territory. Everybody has done the Marriage of Figaro. There are magnificent, magnificent recordings by all the famous Marriage of Figaro people. You know, you've got Bohm and Colin Davis and Giolini, and you know, they're all great. And for that reason, I chose René Jacob again. I really do want to push this series. It's a wonderful series. There's one exception, but but basically, it, it's been it's been a revelation. They have been superb performances um, on period instruments. And if you're going to go with period instruments, you, you really have to do either Jacob or or John Elliott Gardner. I mean, those are really the great period instrument versions. I think so far. I mean, the earlier Arnold Arnold Ostman did a good cozy. There's some others, but. This is just, oh my goodness, it's wonderful. It's with Simon Keenley's side is the Count and Veronique Jean is the Countess. Oh, she's gorgeous. And Patrizia Cioffi is Susanna. And, and Lorenzo Regazzo is Figaro. And Angelica Kirschlager, Angelica Kirschlager is Cherubino. Ooh, baby. It's just great. And again, it's with the it's, this is with Concerto Köln, not the Freiburg Baroque Orchestra. I actually like them better than the Freiburgers, and it's glorious. Absolutely glorious modern Figaro. I went with modern one. I could have picked, you know, like one of the great older ones, but I'm going with a modern one. And if you want to provide your ideal list of these same works with whatever other earlier works you want to toss in, then you can pick somebody else. But that's, that's mine. Then came Don Giovanni. Well... 
That is the Mozart opera par excellence, the one everybody does over and over and over again. They've made movies, they've done stuff. I saw it in Prague. It's still it's still running in Prague. It has to be the longest running opera in the world. They they don't do it at the Estates Theater where Mozart originally did it, but it's another little theater next door. Um, and and it's it's been playing continuously ever since, mostly for tourists in rather good productions. I've seen it there a couple times, and it's been very very enjoyable. I mean, it must be driving the cast crazy, but it's 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 there because it's been very popular in Prague. And I chose Gardner. Gardner's Don Giovanni is fan this is fantastic. It's thrillingly dramatic, incredibly, incredibly exciting, wonderfully sung. Who's the cast here? Uh, oh, let's see. Oh, it's like important people here. I have, this is the box of all the Gardner things. If I want to find out who's actually in it. I'm going to have to sort of take out the bookie here. Give me a second. And let's see. Let's see. Oh, they have Idomeneo too, which is quite good. And it has oh, Idomeneo, plot, story. Hang on a minute. Give me a second. I'm getting there. Okay, that was The Marriage of Figaro. And now we get to Don Giovanni. Oh, here it is. Okay, so Don Giovanni is Rodney Guilfrey, who's absolutely great. The Commendatore, well, doesn't really matter. All he does is get killed and then suck Don Giovanni down to hell at the end of the opera. Um, and that, that's Andrea Silvestrelli. And we have Luba Orgonosova as Donna Anna. And Christophe Pregardien is Don Ottavio. Charlotte Mangiono, Margiono, pardon me, is Donna Elvira. That's such a great role. Oh, boy, is that a great role. I mean, you get to sing Mitradi. What could be more fun? Ooh, it's great, great stuff. And Leporello is Idelbrando D'Arcangelo. And, you know, let's see, Massetto is Julian Clarkson. And Arian James is Zerlina. It's a wonderful, wonderful cast. But the exciting thing is the final scene. Oh, my God, with trombones. When Don Giovanni gets sucked down to hell, I mean... It's just, it's a knockout. It's terrifying. Absolutely terrifying. It's the most thrilling recording of it on disc, I really think. So Gardner is your guy for Don G. And you can get this Gardner box, by the way, if, that has everything. It has Edomineo, from Edomineo to the Magic Flute, including Clemenza de Tito. And you're in really good shape for Mozart operas. They're very good, all of them. They really are. Finally, let's see, finally, not even finally, next, Cosi. Okay, Cosi Fantute. All women are like that. That's really what that means, because Cosi means thus, or that, or in that way, or this way, or something like that. Fan is what they do, means to do. And Tute is the feminine plural of Tutti. That's where the women come from. You know, people look at it as cosy fun tutti. Well, how can you say all women are like that? Well, because tutte with an E is the feminine plural in Italian. And that's how you know. He's talking about the gals. And so here we have, well, I'm going historical for cosy. Carion's mono. It's mono, but very good mono. I mean, it's very listable mono. This is a classic. It's very slightly cut. It's missing a couple arias. You'll never even notice. With Elizabeth Schwarzkopf, Nan Merriman, Rolando Panerai, Leopold Simono, uh, Lisa Otto, and Sesto Bruschantini. This is such a great performance. What makes this performance so great is the intimacy, the chamber-like give and take. The, the, it, it, it's an ensemble cast. It's so relaxed and conversational. It, it's amazing. It's really, really amazing. I mean, there has never been a performance that has quite that element of of natural sort of, you know, you feel like you're eavesdropping on a conversation between all of these people going through their stuff. I mean, the later EMI one that Baum made was also fabulous, you know, and, and so there there are quite a few good ones of these and on period instruments too. But this is a classic. It's a historical classic in very listenable sound, and it's probably the best Mozart recording that Carion ever made. I mean, especially for Mozart operas. I mean, Carion was was always a little bit, you know, on the heavy side. But here, um, with the Philharmonia, 
you know, it's a Walter Legg production. It, it's really, really, really great. And I it's only, uh, it's not quite, it, it's not, it's two hours and about 40 minutes, which is probably enough of cozy for most of us. It's just, this is such a wonderful opera, but it's, it's, the one where it's the most cynical of all the Mozart operas because you don't know whether anyone is serious or not or honest or not. or, And the plot is a study in triviality, of course. It's just two guys who, you know, decide to switch roles and make love to each other's girlfriends on a bet. So it's, oh, it's great. It was considered indecent and immoral during the Victorian period. And hence, it was it was banned, but it's, and the orchestral writing is so beautiful. Oh my God, it's beautiful, especially the clarinets, the Mozart's use of clarinets. You know, Mozart had a love instrument. The love instrument was the clarinet. When he was able to get clarinets, he always used them, and he always used them in arias about the declaration of love. He thought that sexy, liquid sonority of the clarinet symbolized love, and you can trace Mozart's use of the clarinet throughout his his love arias, which actually I do in my book here, but it's really it's really very cool to know you know certain certain composers have love woodwinds. Richard Strauss's love instrument was the oboe, you know that's the the love themes for example in in his Don Juan that's the tone poem, and you know and in Don Quixote you know you find the oboe is usually the love instrument. To the best of my knowledge, no one has used a bassoon or a sarusophone as their love instrument, and the piccolo doesn't get a lot of attention as a love instrument either. But Mozart's clarinet, Strauss's oboe, love music. You find composers have that particular, have their, their own personal way of expressing these things, and it's wonderful. Oh, it's wonderful. Strauss and the Sinfonia Domestica, you know, the oboe d'amore. Need I say more? Okay, the magic flute. I hate the magic flute. I'm being very honest with you. I think it is just the most stupid pile of horse crap in the world. I think the plot is racist, it's misogynist, it's obnoxious. And unlike some people, I take these things seriously. I really do. I take the story seriously and I take what the composer did seri seriously. I am not arguing that the music in The Magic Flute is magnificent. I mean, I love the music. I love the Queen of the Night opera arias. I love Pamina's Ah, Ich Fools. Even, even, you know, that stupid thing for Papagino, you know, I'm the bird thing, ho, ho, ho. You know, I'm, it's fine. There, it's great stuff. It's great. But boy, I cannot stand the opera. The story is just, you know, we all know it's a fairy tale. It's, it's silly, it's ridiculous. It's to cater to the lower class taste of the Viennese public of the day. And that's what it does. And they were lower class. The whole thing is just trash. And it's a pity because it's attached to some of the greatest music that Mozart ever wrote. And so that redeems the whole thing. Some people say, I don't think so. I just like to listen to the arias and the best bits and ignore the whole totality of it. I mean, I, I find Sarastro and all of his boring, his boring, whatever the hell they are, Masons or whatever they are, just, just dull. And, and, and Manistatos is, is, is offensive. And gosh, he's offensive. You know, the whole thing is just irritating. But, um, and so for that reason, one of the recordings I really love is Klemperer's because it has no dialogue. You know, he was very smart about that. He was like, no, nah, they had a big fight about it. You know, with Walter Lake, he wanted to, they wanted him to include the dialogue. If you want the grand magisterial magic flute, you can't do better than Klemperer. But I didn't. I chose for this particular one, Claudio Abbado, believe it or not. Claudio Abbado with the Mahler Chamber Orchestra and the Arnold Schoenberg Choir. And you've got, let's see, Rene Pop. And the Queen of the Night is, is I, I can't even read this. Erica Miklosa, there we go. She's got to have, I think, her arias are the best. Anna Russell said that the Queen of the Night has a, a voice of the type that can sing so high that it can only be heard by dogs. Yes, that's it. Absolutely. And Dorothea Rushman, again, is Pamina. She's such a great singer. And let's see, Christoph Strel, 
is Tamino and Pappuccino. Oh, I don't care about Pappuccino. Anyway, this is a wonderful performance. It's wonderful for its freshness, for its lightness, for it being the anti clemperer <laughs> It has, of course, its serious moments because the music is serious. I mean, you know, you have to do what the music tells us to do, but it's really, really, really good. Excuse me. It is also, I think, Claudio Abbato's best Mozart opera. He was not a Mozart guy. He really wasn't. And a lot of his worst performances orchestrally and instrumentally are Mozart, but he was a great accompanist. And like I said, you know, some of these guys, when they get behind an orchestra with a wonderful cast of singers, it's, it's just, they, you know, magic happens. And I think this is a marvelous magic flute. And there you go. Finally, there's La Clemenza di Tito. Now, this is an opera that has only been sort of recovered in recent decades. It was Mozart's, well, it was written around the same time as the Magic Flute. You know, it probably came second or first or it's in, in that area. The last thing you really did in the operatic world it is an old fashioned opera seria. In fact, Gluck wrote a La Clemenza de Tito in the old opera seria style, but it contained his most famous aria, which became O oh, Malheureuse Iphigenie, which we discussed in one of the world's greatest melodies, one of those talks. So, yeah, it's absolutely marvelous. Oh, I hear bells, oh, whatever that is, that doesn't make any difference. So, La Clemenza de Tito, yes, where were we? It's a ridiculous, ridiculous story. You know, Tito has all these people trying to kill him and he keeps forgiving them. You know, it means the clemency or the forgiveness of Tito. I mean, that's the story. That's the plot. In fact, they burn down Rome and he forgives them. It's just so dumb. But it has Vitellia, the character of Vitellia, who is the most horrible woman in all of opera. She is trying to murder everybody. She's exploiting her lover. She's the one who burns down Rome. And so Mozart gives her the best music. She has two of the greatest arias that Mozart ever wrote with basset clarinet accompaniments. Clarinets, there they are, the clarinets. And I chose for La Clemenza de Tito, which has received many, many very fine recordings, good old Carl Böhm. This is really really gorgeous. You know, Böhm was a great Mozartian. Uh, he had wonderful, wonderful performances of Don Giovanni and his Figaro was great. You know, there's, again, you know, you can choose your style and then go with them in these operas. But this is a great Clemenza and it's got Peter Schreier as Tito and Julia Varadé as a Vitellia. Yes. And Edith Matis as Servilla, Teresa Berganza, Theo Adam and Marga Schimmel with the Staatskapelle Dresden. Yes, I mean, this is just a Mozartian love fest for a really hopeless piece of music that actually it's gotten performed now because it's Mozart, it's late Mozart, like all late Mozart, it has great music. But like I said, I do take the stories and the composer's intentions seriously. And like the Magic Flute, the story is hokum. And I never want to see La Clemenza de Tito live. There's nothing interesting in any of the characters except for Vitellia. Just, just play the arias. Don't worry about the plot. If you want to get the complete opera, you can. It's good to listen to. Just don't follow the words. Just play it and listen to it. In that sense, it's gorgeous. Absolutely gorgeous. And Bohm's, I think, is, well, at least one of the ones to get. And with that, we have gotten through a lot of Mozart operatic stuff. And if you have a list, I'm dying to see what's on it. You can repeat. Now, you know, you want to use mine, you can repeat some of the ones I repeat, you know, I did. And, and or substitute anything you want. Throw in some of the earlier ones if you have some that you particularly love. I'm very interested to see what you make of this, but I hope this gives you an ideal list, a mix of, of modern period instrument performances, classic older versions, something in the middle, some of the early stuff. I've tried to be as balanced as I possibly could to give you 
the ultimate Mozartian experience in the smallest possible space for when you begin building your Mozart opera collection, which of course you absolutely have to do eventually when you feel up to it. Anyway, so keep on listening, folks. Thank you for joining me. Take care.